Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of Good Stuff. This is the Sky and Telescope uh, series. And I am very happy to have Sky and Telescope author Steve Goldberg with us today. Hi, Steve. Hi, Frank. Well, it's, it's nice to be here. And thanks for the invite. Oh, well, thank you so much for talking about your lovely Sky and Telescope uh, article. And we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, so, Steve, what's your, what's your geolocation? Where are you at? I am physically right now in Eureka, Missouri, which is a little southwest of St. Louis. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, for those who know the area, Eureka also is where Six Flags is located in, in this part of the country. <laughs> <laughs> Roller coasters. Um, yeah, Six Flags is, is great. I haven't been to that one, but um, yeah. So that is some pretty awesome uh, material you have around you there. So let's start with those two pictures over your left and right shoulders. Uh, what are those? Well, my, my wife, Jessica, who is uh, a gifted artist who painted the Milky Way for me that was used in the article. Um, these are two more of her paintings. These are not photographs. They're watercolors that she did for me. Um, the first one here was the Southern Pinwheel Galaxy. Then she later did the Trivet Nebula. And this one especially was a surprise she did for me. I was working away from home and I knew she was painting a different painting, not a, non astronomical for an art show that she was going to put it in. And she uh, took me to the art show. And then besides showing me that painting, then walked me over and showed me this one hanging on the wall. Very cool. It was a very pleasant surprise. Very cool. Thank you, Jessica. These are really great watercolors. Wow. Yeah, I can tell she's been uh, she's been painting for a while. Very cool. And then you have uh, a pretty awesome looking cool chronometer there off to your uh, left there. It's right right here, and that is uh, on a mini iPad. It's something uh, ah. software that a friend of mine pointed me to that is available just for um ipads but it's it's got a clock that uh, shows the position of the planets to the their, their accurate their positions to the sun their rising setting times moon phases just all kinds of great information that uh, can entertain me while i'm working here at my desk that is awesome very cool so speaking of uh all the astronomy stuff around you um how did you get into astronomy when when did you get into astronomy well, um, date myself a little bit. I was growing up in the 60s uh, uh -huh. and like so many kids became fascinated with the space program, the race to the moon. Mm -hmm. um, I was very young, but uh, watched Alan Shepard's first launch and then watched every launch of Mercury, Gemini and Apollo. All right. And, uh, became fascinated with um, astronomy and with flying like many kids. I wanted to be an astronaut, you know, that life didn't actually take me that way but uh before getting into um astronomy academically like this i did become a pilot mm -hmm. um and not not only uh being able to fly uh, and with the air force i was in f4 phantoms and c-130s but uh yeah. also um became an airline pilot and was uh a, a captain for TWA and then American Airlines when they acquired TWA mm -hmm. became a, a, a an instructor pilot and a Czech airman checking proficiency on the MD 80s. That's most I, I flew a lot of different airplanes. That's the one that I specialize mostly. Mm -hmm. And um, but at that time is when I started. And when I was at TWA, I decided I, it was time to go to grad school. And <laughs> and uh, Oh, basically a lot. My, 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 my son, one of my sons, Greg, Gregory, he uh, teased me because I went to grad school working toward a master's and a PhD. And he said, I was just doing it for fun, which it, in the beginning, it, he was not incorrect because I didn't have any plan for it. I just wanted to do it. Yeah. I had wanted to get back to astronomy Good. and, and cool. the university of Oklahoma, um, set up a very special master's degree program where I was able to study ancient astronomy, which is something that had become a big fascination for me. And uh, 
I got some just wonderful ed education opportunities through the, them that I probably couldn't have got anywhere else and wrote my master's thesis on the Babylonian astronomical diaries, which uh, for anyone who hasn't, isn't really familiar with them, back in the first millennium BC, the Babylonians for oh, roughly 700 years every night recorded the position of the uh, moon and the planets in relation to certain normal stars that they're called that uh, basically are some of the primary stars in our zodiac since it was the babylonians sumerians that kind of created that in the first place mm -hmm. and the babylonians were very good with astronomy even before this that back in the second millennium bc they uh had a fairly good mathematical astronomy going they they, they knew algebra and some geometry mm -hmm. and um they were good at predicting events um and there's even a, a cuneiform tablet that was found that and has the relationships on pythagorean theorem inscribed on it a thousand years before pythagoras lived um but they the diaries they, they they for 700 years made these nightly recordings except you know if the sky was overcast and if you think about our modern science, yeah, roughly 400 years since the time of Galileo, they got 700 years of data. They got really good at predicting uh, different events, uh, planetary positions, eclipses. Can you imagine a, 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 a priest telling his king that in such and such a time, the sky is going to go dark? After that, the king's going to pretty well accept anything that uh, anything, <laughs> this guy exactly. says. Okay, I believe you. I believe you. <laughs> anyway, anyway, I, I, I finished that degree and then decided I wanted to keep going and uh, <clears throat> found my way into a uh, PhD program for astronomy. Nice. And the and I was had approved, though, do, uh, doing my uh, dissertation work, my Oh, I went to school in Australia, so it was actually a doctoral thesis um, on Inca astronomy. And oh. that's that's where I first got started here. I um, went on, at that time, five different research expeditions in the Peruvian Andes, which was just another one of those wonderful life experiences that that uh, you would I would never want to trade for anything. Oh, climbing around between eight and 15,000 feet above sea level, exploring um, temples and shrines and caves and capturing a lot of photographic evidence supporting the great amount of intentional light and shadow effects that the Incas built into their empire, all kinds of places. Um, and, and then uh, actually retired early from the airline to when I decided I you know, needed to go to school full time to finish this up. But then when I you know, when I when I when I had my degree conferred about that time, they and I started looking toward finding an academic position then. But a friend of mine from my airline days talked me into helping him and uh, some guys start a new airline in Barbados. Ooh, okay. So, you know, I, I, I was on the fence at first, but Jessica, my wonderful wife, she's very wise. She said, Steve, you can teach later. Let's go live on a Caribbean island. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so they, they, you know, he wanted me to help because, again, they were going to start the airline with MD-80s, an airline called Red Jet. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, I, and I, so I came down and, and we got the airline going, got it flying. I ultimately became the director of flight operations. I was responsible for half the employees in the company, all the pilots and flight attendants and dispatchers. And, okay. and uh, it was a lot of fun. It was a privilege living in Barbados. And we lived in a, in a house with a pool right on the ocean front, watching the sun and moon rise over the water. <laughs> and we still go back. Yeah, no complaints there. <laughs> we still go back to visit friends you know, try to at least once a year the last couple of years that's been kind of disrupted but uh is normally the airline still around no no um there, there was uh you know, there, there's not open skies you have to get permission of two governments for every flight okay. and we weren't getting them fast enough the to overcome the fixed costs uh, the airline lasted for quite a while but um ultimately with that and some political 
things going on it, it sure. ultimately didn't make it but it sure was fun while it lasted absolutely you got i came i came i came back and started teaching um i i had already started teaching an introductory astronomy course part-time for online for the university of oklahoma Ooh. And, I, and i also uh taught in uh, astronomy then in uh embry riddles worldwide uh -huh. campus mm -hmm. yep. but then started focusing on oklahoma um it, as i taught more and more courses for them uh, i was basically a full-time adjunct for a while and then they decided they wanted me to join the regular faculty so they I applied and, uh, and went through that process um so that's kind of process. you know coming uh, you know getting started with the space program and learning to fly and then uh, getting the doctorate in astronomy, it kind of brought it all together, ultimately. Very so nice. That's how I got started. <laughs> so what is what is your current position? I am at, in the University of Oklahoma, it's divided into many different colleges and I'm in the College of Professional and Continuing Studies, like, like it mentions here at the end of the article. I think, well, it mentions the University of Oklahoma. Um, we are the, arm of the university that since 1961 has specialized specialized in distance learning uh -huh. okay. and of course there was no internet back then in those days it was uh mail <laughs> and then later email there's now websites of course for course websites um and i'm the within the college of that college i'm the lead faculty basically the department chair for the college or the school of um integrative and cultural studies oh cool okay and uh it includes a number of different uh areas and programs but the one that i'm most fond of is the one that i i and a friend of mine uh andy monroe started ourselves which is a, a graduate level program in archaeoastronomy and astronomy and culture we have um there's a there's a you know, if, if somebody want is interested and wants to search it's not hard to find the website the web pages for it through the university of oklahoma just you know if you do a search for university of oklahoma archaeoastronomy it should come right up um, but we started with graduate courses and there's now seven of them and we're getting ready to launch an undergraduate our undergraduate side with the first courses starting in january okay and, that, and it's just I've, all, I, I've always liked teaching back, you know, starting with when I was teaching guys to fly the MD-80 and then teaching other courses for Oklahoma, but I've never had so much fun teaching as I'm doing now teaching archaeoastronomy in, in different ways to cool. the different classes. Um, so and, then, will, uh, and then along, along with all that, um, the International Astronomical Union has taken a definite interest in archaeoastronomy, which is why um, we now have the IAU Working Group for Archaeoastronomy, Astronomy and Culture that I'm there, the chair for. And um, that that's just a, a keeps getting growing bigger and stronger. And I'm just I'm, I'm enjoying promoting archaeoastronomy both through the program at school and through the IAU and the international um, contacts I have there and all the all of the um, colleagues that I meet and associate with. We've got this one committee within the working group where we're dealing with culturally sensitive sites. The IU president came to me and said that it would be really good to have a joint collaborative initiative with the Royal Astronomical Society and the American Astronomical Society. So the three of us are working together um, to get more information out to astronomers about the cultural sensitivities at sites where major observatories have been built on sacred grounds or ones that are being planned. Right. Um, and, you know, the 30 meter telescope in Mauna Kea certainly is a, a, one of the first examples that would come to mind, but that's by, not by any means the, the only, only place where this is going on. So we've had, we've had three um, presentations so far, one for the IU's CAP 2021 in May, and then for the American Astronomical Society 238 in June, and just uh, just this month in July for the Royal Astronomical Society's National Astronomy Meeting. And it's mm -hmm. we all going all going great and we're, we're learning more. And, and and I guess what brought this to mind was talking about global colleagues and the people in the committee. 
um, span 19 time zones and we try to get together on Zoom, it's <laughs> a bit of a challenge. <laughs> challenge. But, it, but, it, but it's fun. Oh, very cool. That is so awesome. And we are going to talk about some of this when we get into this very lovely Sky and Telescope article, The Sky Through Different Eyes by Steve Goldberg, The Milky Way's Dark Constellations. And Steve, take us away. Well, just uh, kind of an overview here without reading it. Um, you know, I began the article talking about, you know, just a wonderful opportunity I had going to the Okie Tech Star Party in Kenton, Oklahoma back in 2019. Obviously, the pandemic's disrupted things a little bit since then, but um, that was wonderful because, you know, obviously star parties are where the skies are dark. And that was the first time I had been to such a pitch black sky in a long time and couldn't just detect that the Milky Way was there, but I could really see the Milky Way and it, it was wonderful. Nice. Um, Very cool. But, uh, you know, when I, when I was first uh, doing my research in in the Peruvian Andes, actually, this would have been on the second of the five times I went down working on my degree. Um, my <clears throat> primary research assistant, Car Carlos Aranabar, we were, we had, we had, the team, we had climbed up the Octopata Ridge, which is opposite Machu Picchu, um, yeah. about five kilometers in the distance. And back in 2003, um, my doctoral supervisor actually and some of his colleagues uh, discovered the structures at Yaktapata. There was over a hundred of them totally engulfed in the cloud forest. If you think of the jungles down at sea level and how thick the vegetation gets, right. it, gets just, it gets just as thick in the cloud forest. There were all these structures there five kilometers across the gorge from Machu Picchu. They could have been in plain sight if it weren't for the vegetation and no one knew they were there. I mean, I say no one, the farmers, local farmers, I'm sure knew they were there, but um, they, they, they weren't scientifically known, right. but uh, they were a team through some, through some, uh, some of the writings of Hiram Bingham from Yale, who was the first one who scientifically explored Machu Picchu in 1911, and then made some big publishing with National Geographic. They worked, went through some of his work and yeah. did research and eventually yeah. found the structures that he had just alluded to in some of his notes. Um, so anyway, uh, this would have been now in June of 2007. I was there for the June solstice sunrise. We had climbed up the Octopata Ridge and we're going to camp out overnight to wait for the sunrise in the morning. You know, it's one of those things you can't climb up in the morning to be there. You got to be there the day before. So, and so while we were there that night, Carlos took my green laser pointer and he gave me a tour of the dark constellations that the Inca see in the Milky Way. It's just a, a tremendous experience seeing those for the first time and having him you know, you know, with green laser pointers, how wonderful they are for outlining things in the sky. Mm -hmm. to, and, and I've been impressed with the dark constellations ever since. Nice. Um, I guess we can uh, switch the page, Frank. Um, okay. Here's another one of Jessica's paintings. Yeah, the, the first p image there was a photo that was showing the Colsac Nebula. And then here is Jessica's painting. That, this is for comparison purposes. You can see the photo and then Jessica's painting with the Colsac Nebula, which is good for reference because her painting is what we'll use for the rest of the article. Okay. Um, so anyway, the Incas saw uh, primarily seven figures in this stretch of the Milky Way that uh, crosses about 150 degrees. Um, if you look where the, you can see, you know, we use the Colsac Nebula for a reference there. Uh, obviously, they, they didn't call it that. When I when I try to find this part of the sky, I usually find the uh, Magellanic Clouds, and and they kind of point up toward the Colsac Nebula and the uh, Southern Cross, mm -hmm. and then the constellations, as you'll see in a in, in another photo, will kind of go to the left and right of that. I guess we could we could switch over to those, Frank. Here are in Jessica's painting, um, and also a great shout out here to the Sky and Telescope's art department for, I, 
their, their figures that they drew on the painting are better than mine. So, <laughs> um, but uh, in the, the, of course, this is all marching across the sky from left to right. So the, the lead creature is on the right, number one, which is Machiquai the serpent, and then followed by um, the next Han Patu the toad, number two, and then what we think of as the coal sack, coal sack they called Yutu with a tinamu, which is a bird in, in uh, South America. And then four is um, Yakana, the mother Yama. And I learned how to pronounce Yama the way that they pronounce it, not Lama. Yeah. And, and then um, beneath baby. the mother Yama is the baby Yama suckling its mother. This is Yuni Yamaka. And then Atok the fox follows next. And then there's a two different opinions. Um, Gary Ertin, who did a lot of the early research here, said number seven was another U2, but uh, more commonly you see Mishiruna, the shepherd, uh, uh, herding all of the creatures is number seven. Right. Well, yeah. And so, so, you know, this was basically with the Inca song, the creatures will be, were very much part of their cosmology and uh, what, and what, and, and they're, they're, and the Incas believed everything to be interrelated and the, the, what was in the sky, what was in the ground, the mountains and rivers and water gave animate, sentient power to what otherwise would be rocks or, or and trees or, or all kinds of things like that. Um, yeah. So this, this, this was a big part of their culture, seeing these in the sky. And they, they, uh, they recognized other things with stars as well, but this is a, you know, more unusual because there aren't stars involved here. It's just patches in the Milky Way that are where the light from the stars behind are obscured by the interstellar gas and dust. Mm. Very nice. um, I love it. So, but anyway, this was, you know, the Incas. So, you know, in addition to the Incas, were there others who um, saw constellations? And on the map there, before we turn the page, you can see the McCoy in Argentina did as well. And um, if we move on to the next page, ah, with the map. in that same section of the of the, the galaxy, you yeah. can see the, 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 the head of the manic, the figure here is at the coal sack again. And, and, and this was a figure in their culture that stretched out uh, to the left from there. Um, I learned a lot about this from uh, a good friend of mine, Alejandro Lopez, who uh, lives down in Buenos Aires. He teaches at university down there and he has you know, studied this extensively. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and we, we talk frequently. Um, and the, the, the Maniac, uh, they believed, uh, the, the McCoy believed each animal species had a master and the Maniac was the mythical master of the Rias in South America, another big bird, big flightless bird, similar to ostriches. Now right. uh, we can turn the page again. Okay, yeah, there we go, the emu. <clears throat> and, um, and then, yeah. then also in that same part of the galaxy again in Australia, is the emu, another large flightless bird. And his head, the emu's head there is right on the coal sack again. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and then uh, uh, they, they also saw a kangaroo at, at, and, the, and at different times. And then the, and the kangaroo, by, was, there's many different cultures in, in Australia, but the kangaroo is, you can see it was inscribed there with the emu. And some some trailing this also thought, thought they saw crocodiles, but mm -hmm. uh, another good friend of mine, Dwayne Hamaker, does an, an, a lot of research with the indigenous, the uh, Aboriginal Australians, and is learning from their elders about these uh, and <laughs> other and other aspects of cultural astronomy there. And there's been a number of other researchers as well. I'm just uh, cl worked closest closest on this with Dwayne. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but uh, the, the emu uh, tra traces uh, different orientations in the sky and it fits in with the, the culture that the, um, and you can scroll down again, the, it fits in with the, the, the different cultural aspects that the, the people had as far as um, talking about uh, when the 
emu is pursuing a male to mate and has gained uh, altitude and now it's a male nesting and incubating eggs. Um, and, they, and that was common with the emus that the, the males actually would take care of them. And that fit into the cultural traditions of the, of the people there as well. Um, and, and you can see on the map here where some of the different cultures, the ones that are, were brought up in the article here, were, were located. Um, and, and also um, put on the map there, the, the Maori astronomy in New Zealand. Um, Wayne Orcheston, another great colleague of mine, and he's also, also was another one of my doctoral supervisors. He um, has done a lot of work with the Maori. Wayne, Wayne's in actually located in Thailand now, so he does a lot of uh, a lot of work there as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if we can collapse, you know, zoom zoom this out. in again here, yeah. Um, I've also done a lot of work with uh, Andy Monroe, who's also works with me like at OU. Like I said, he was the co-founder co for me with uh, the archaeoastronomy program there. And, and Javier Mishuto in, in Honduras, uh, he has uh, done a lot of good work and found some Milky Way ori orientated activity in the, in the cultures down there as well. Um, but anyway, what what is curious is how you know, a number of cultures saw these same types of creatures. I, I mean, it, in in the same section of the Milky Way galaxy, mm -hmm. and it was all the southern cultures. Of course, that stretch of the sky coming up on the Southern Cross and everything is most prominent down there, yeah. and it, and it's very you know brilliant and lends itself very well to this. A good question that has come about is you know why weren't there at least some similar efforts in the north and perhaps we'll discover them someday but we haven't really run across much in that way so far hmm. interesting okay. um, another another thing thing that came up for the future maybe an extension of this article that uh that um wayne orgeston my, my 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 friend and mentor brought up was that uh we could we should go on to explain why there are these similarities and differences among the different Milky Way stories found worldwide. Go into more detail on that, more expansive. So, um, uh, anyway, assembling a series of case studies and present them in an attempt to show more of a comparison of the similarities and differences and the cultural reasons behind them. Yeah, yeah, that would be very interesting. This this first article was kind of an introduction to the fact that this exists, which um, not everyone is aware of, and and it and it's and, it, and I find it fascinating, and I hope that a lot of the readers did too. Super, super. Well, I really look forward to uh, um, some of your research articles on on this, and we'll put some links to those in the description below the video, and I look forward to uh, uh, version two, version three of this article on dark constellations and other other cultures take on the sky. It's really cool. Oh, it, it, it's very fascinating. And archaeoastronomy, like, well, I, I, it's, you know, I don't have to tell you how fascinated I am with it. because It's got to be pretty obvious. Well, you got um, the whole program going. I think a lot of people find it very fascinating. Um, Spring, so. Springer, Springer last year published a book of mine, Archaeoastronomy of the Inca Empire, Use of Significance of the Night Sky. and. Uh, I'm getting ready to write another one. Um, it just a one up good opportunity after the next. But I really enjoyed writing this article with Camille Carlisle for the for Sky and Telescope. She was she's just an out, amazing editor, outstanding to work with. I, I I enjoyed the whole process very much. Very cool, very cool. Nice shout outs to uh, Camille and your archaeoastronomy colleagues. That was really wonderful. So Steve, I want to thank you so much again for sharing your Sky and Telescope article with us. Well, um, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, it's not hard to tell. I love talking about archaeoastronomy. And it's easy to talk about this because this is a very fascinating part of it that, that I, I like, you know, making as many people aware of as I can. And they, by having this article in Sky and Telescope that exposed a whole lot of additional people to mm -hmm. the Incas and the Australians and the McCoy saw in the sky. Very nice, very nice. 
All right, everyone, that will do, and we will see you on the next one. And I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks.